Hello there, and thank you for the opportunity to give a talk at this conference. My name is James Scheibner, and I am an academic lawyer working for the College of Business, Government and Law at Flinders University in Adelaide, Australia. At this point, you might be asking yourself what someone like me is doing presenting at a bioinformatics conference. To give you some background, I completed my PhD in law on the question of intellectual property rights and bioinformatics software back in 2018. As a postdoctoral research fellow, I also co-authored a research paper, an article and a soon to be published book chapter on the role of law in citizen science projects. These publications had a specific focus on open science and Internet of Things devices. In this video, I will be drawing on my research on intellectual property rights and citizen science so far to talk about the role that intellectual property rights play in open source bioinformatics projects. As part of my thesis, I conducted a series of expert interviews with experts in the field of bioinformatics. And what I discovered is that intellectual property rights are a very controversial topic among scientific researchers and developers. Now, I covered quite a fair bit of detail in my thesis, so I won't be covering everything I wrote back then. Instead, I will focus on three specific areas of my thesis. I will first talk about what intellectual property rights potentially apply to bioinformatics software. I will distinguish the applicability of formal intellectual property rights to both proprietary and open source bioinformatics software. I will then talk about the theoretical lens of a knowledge commons and explain why open source software, and in particular open source bioinformatics software, shares the characteristics of a knowledge commons. I will also consider the relationship between traditional forms of technology transfer and technology transfer for software governed as a knowledge commons. I will then conclude by offering recommendations on how to consider the role that formal intellectual property rights play in open source bioinformatics projects. Before I continue, I should mention though that in this video, everything I say is offered without privilege. In other words, it is not legal advice. Should you find yourself in a situation where a lawyer is sending you angry emails about breaching their client's intellectual property rights, I strongly recommend that you seek legal advice. In addition, there might be other legal reasons that you may or may not wish to make your software source code available. I note that for last year's CWL conference, there was a video discussing the role that CWL plays in producing software-only medical devices. To receive regulatory approval for this software to be used in a clinical device, it might be necessary to disclose the source code. First, what do I mean by intellectual property rights? And what intellectual property rights apply to bioinformatics software? At the start of this video, I used intellectual property rights as a term of convenience. But intellectual property rights are a broad neologism used to cover a range of legally recognisable rights to intangible property. The reason why I use the word neologism here is that intellectual property as a concept is relatively recent and has become more popular as a result of treaties that were designed to standardise protection across different countries. It is worthwhile bearing in mind though, as I do in my thesis, that intellectual property rights do not refer to one single overarching right that is equivalent to, say, property rights in land. Instead, intellectual property rights include a group of multiple legal regimes, sometimes overlapping, that are often reinforced through contractual agreements. Therefore, these contracts not only have the potential to act as an inhibitor for open science, but also as a mechanism to promote open science. There are three categories of right which can potentially apply to bioinformatics workflows, copyright, patents, and trade secrets. As I alluded to previously, it is important to note that each right applies to different distinct types of intangible works, as well as offering different levels of protection. Copyright is a type of right that applies to the expression of creative works, including literary works. Patents are a type of right that offers a time-limited monopoly to exploit useful, novel and inventive products and processes. Trade secrecy, sometimes referred to as confidential information or know-how, refers to any information or data which is, well, kept secret. Unlike patents, which need to be registered with a patent office, copyright arises automatically as soon as a creative work is expressed and published. However, for copyright to arise, there needs to be a creative element to that work. Copyright cannot exist in mere compilations, in mathematical formulae, or in facts. Likewise, copyright only extends to the expression of a particular work. The ideas themselves are not copyrightable. Now, 
How does all this relate to bioinformatics software? Let's take copyright to start with. As copyright applies to literary works, it is relatively well established that software source code is copyrightable. Almost everyone at this conference will be familiar with different open source licenses, such as the GNU General Public License Agreement and the Apache license. Although the GPL was drafted with a very anti-copyright perspective in mind, they in fact do rely on copyright law to give effect to copyleft provisions. However, as I alluded to previously, copyright cannot apply to the ideas underpinning a particular piece of software. To demonstrate this, let's take BLAST as an example. The BLAST algorithm itself, which was made available by the NCBI, is copyright protected but has been made a public domain work by the US government. The source code of BLAST is a copyright protected work, but the idea of sequence alignment software is not copyrightable. Likewise, graphical user interfaces for software programs are considered more functional than literary works, and therefore the ideas underlying an interface are not subject to copyright protection. The limits of copyright protection have meant that commercial software developers, including in the scientific software space, increasingly have sought to rely on patent protection. As I'm sure everyone here is aware, the proliferation of software patents has been controversial and cause for considerable concern amongst open source software developers. Nevertheless, the availability of patents for software and business methods has been increasingly constrained in the past decade. In the United States, a series of Supreme Court cases have constrained the scope of patentable subject matter, or what might be considered patentable. Now, in these cases, the courts use some particularly dense legalese, but the general ruling that we can extract from these cases is that an abstract idea cannot be patented if it only requires a general purpose computer to run. Similar decisions in my home country of Australia have concluded that patent protection should not extend to generic functions on a general purpose of computer. What does this mean for bioinformatics, and in particular, open source bioinformatics? If software is designed to run on specialised hardware, it is possible that this may be considered patentable subject matter. Conversely, bioinformatics software that runs on general purpose computers is less likely to be considered patentable. Accordingly, the recent decisions that I have referred to have reduced the threat of unintentional patent infringement for open source bioinformatics. The decline in patenting as a strategy has meant though that increasingly commercial software developers are relying on trade secrecy to protect source code and functionality. Another important aspect of the bioinformatics workflow is that a commercial developer might want to protect the data used for sequencing. This sequence data can also be protected as a trade secret. You might recall another patent dispute involving Myriad Genetics over the BRCA sequence of patents. Although Myriad lost this dispute, they acquired a substantial repository of genome sequences, which they have been able to retain as a trade secret. In my interviews, which I discuss in the next section of this presentation, repositories of data can be seen as a more valuable proprietary resource than software. By contrast, software is more frequently managed as a shared resource or as a commons. Secondly, what does the term commons mean and how does it relate to open source software? Remember, we discussed the idea of intellectual property rights and how that term is used to create analogies between patents, copyright and private property. This somewhat flawed comparison not only raises questions about the nature of patents and copyright as property, but also the preferred means to manage land and natural resources. It is important to note that privately managed property is not the only means of managing land or natural resources. For example, there are some forms of land that are governed communally, such as urban allotment gardens in Switzerland, fisheries in Maine, and irrigation systems in Nepal. Rather than one person being responsible for managing this resource, its uptake and care is a communal responsibility. Now, orthodox economics suggests that most communally resources are guaranteed to fail on the grounds that they will be subject to overuse. However, we know that at the same time, there are many communally managed resources which do in fact continue to survive without being overused. Why? 
To answer this question, we can draw on the work of Eleanor Ostrom, a Nobel Prize winning economist who studied common pool resources. Ostrom proposed that common pool resources can be successfully managed collectively when there are rules governing who can access these resources and how these resources can be used. Further, Ostrom noted that although there are regional and resource specific differences, these rules can be seen across different common pool resources. These rules include clearly defined boundaries, systems that reward members for their contributions, monitoring, sanctions for breaches, conflict resolution mechanisms, and organizing rights. How does this theoretical lens apply to open source software? Using Ostrom's examples of rules to successfully govern a commons, you can clearly see the relationship between a commons and open source software. Many of the software developers listening to this conference who freely contribute to the CWL or other projects might list their contributions on their resume. Although they are not being paid for their work, there are systems in place that reward them for their contributions. Likewise, as an academic, I am acutely aware of how different publications and in some cases the software that accompanies those publications helps to generate social capital, which can be then used to apply for grants. Further, open source software licenses such as the GPL and the MIT impose differing levels of boundaries on how different developers can use libraries and software under an open source license. If someone were to breach these licenses, they could face both legal consequences and the loss of social capital. Common pool resources and open source software are not necessarily exact equivalents to one another. One of the primary goals of common pool resource governance is to ensure that a particular resource is not overused and to prevent a scenario called the so-called tragedy of the commons. By contrast, an open source software project is non-rivalrous in that one person's use of open source software does not subtract from another's. However, an open source software project can be abandoned by the development team. This situation can be quite common for software that is developed for a particular research project or a thesis, where there is no longer grant money to maintain that software after development. This potential fate highlights the inherent instability of socio-technical resources such as software projects compared to socio-economic and natural resources. Therefore, in describing open source software and similar shared intangible resources, we use the term knowledge commons. For a knowledge commons, the concerns regarding sustainability and rules governing use are different than for a physical common pool resource. First, there is a blurring of the different boundaries between users and producers. Think about an open source bioinformatics project such as CWL and how CWL contributors include both dedicated software developers and researchers who use CWL for their research. Secondly, the goal of a knowledge commons is to encourage use of the informational resource as widely as possible rather than prevent overuse. Thirdly, the main concern of those involved in developing the knowledge commons is not overuse but enclosure. Enclosure is a term used to describe how access to the knowledge commons resource can be limited. Although the goal of any knowledge commons is to encourage use and reuse, this goal often conflicts with a need to sustainability, which is a drive for technology transfer. What do I mean by technology transfer? Let's return to the case of patents and copyright. Simultaneous to the expansion of patent and copyright protection in the 1980s, there was also a push for greater commercialization of university inventions. This trend was exemplified by the passage of the Bayer Doyle Act in the United States, which allowed universities to claim ownership of federally funded inventions. University ownership of inventions was justified on the grounds that it allowed universities to reap the benefits of federally funded research. However, as some of my expert interviewees argued, commercialization of publicly funded research creates a situation where users pay twice for that research, through taxes and through royalties. Further, applying patents and increasingly restrictive licenses to technology, and particularly technology that is used for fundamental research such as bioinformatics, heightens the risk of enclosure. In other words, the actual or perceived impact of restrictive licensing on bioinformatics software can lead to a decline in the use of that software, which can be terminal for project success. Nevertheless, as I'm sure many of you are aware, successful open source projects depend on a team of committed developers. 
although some of the best open source projects are produced by people working in their spare time, others fall into disuse without support from paid developers. Avoiding enclosure whilst maintaining sustainability in the knowledge commons. So far, we have considered how patents and copyright might apply to bioinformatics, and we have considered open source bioinformatics as a knowledge commons. Now we will consider what strategies are available to open source bioinformatics developers to prevent enclosure whilst guaranteeing project sustainability. Here, I will draw on my expert interviews to offer some strategies for the private ordering of bioinformatics projects. Before discussing these strategies, I will describe some fundamental observations about the nature of bioinformatics software. First, it is important, particularly if you work in a university setting, to articulate that most bioinformatics software is not particularly suited to conventional means of technology transfer. As I mentioned previously, universities often encourage researchers to commercialise their software. However, the multitude of free and open source alternatives means that your user base will not pay for programs they can get for free. In addition, there are reputational costs that can be incurred because of restrictive licensing on software. Those of you who might remember the SCO versus Linux lawsuits or the Myriad lawsuit over BRCA gene patents are undoubtedly aware of how quickly public sentiment can turn against a patent or copyright troll. Second, most bioinformatics software, as I mentioned previously, can be described as fundamental basic research in that it supports other research objectives. Fundamental basic research can be contrasted with applied research, such as medical devices and pharmaceuticals, which have a greater potential for commercial application. Third, within bioinformatics and other related fields, such as medical informatics, there is strong community support for promoting standards. Standards are a benefit for open scientific research as they make it easier to exchange data between researchers, therefore encouraging reproducibility and replicability of scientific results. Together, my interviewees consistently observed that these features of bioinformatics meant that the incentive to exclusively license bioinformatics software is not as strong, particularly in the academic sphere. However, the fact that bioinformatics software engineers I interviewed were disinclined towards restrictive licensing did not foreclose the possibility of receiving financial support for their work. For example, one strategy a few of my interviewees discussed was releasing a basic version of bioinformatics software under a free and open source license. For the fee, the developers were then prepared to modify that software for a specific research approach. Likewise, other developers offered to perform paid analyses for other researchers, particularly those researchers who might lack the hardware to conduct such analysis. This approach to software as labour is somewhat equivalent to what the Free Software Foundation and the Software Freedom Conservancy describe as an alternative to software licensing. Further, my subsequent research into citizen science has highlighted the importance of compensating researchers and contributors, either financially or otherwise, for their assistance. In the alternative, some of my interviewees discussed the possibility of only charging for software services if they were being used by commercial developers and researchers. This strategy in particular offered researchers and laboratory leads with a pathway to ensure that they could continue to pay developers to maintain software. In addition, some of my interviewees discussed other strategies designed to promote open source software as part of research grants and encourage sustainability. Although the Bayer-Doyle Act and technology transfer legislation is designed to encourage researchers to assign their intellectual property to universities, they are not obliged to do so. Indeed, there have been several cases, both in the United States and Australia, which recognise that researchers and inventors do automatically retain their rights to research. By retaining rights in their research, academics and software developers can use this to carve out space in their grants for open source licences. In the alternative, several of my interviewees discussed the use of alternative legal arrangements, such as trusts and public charities, to control the copyrights associated with an open source bioinformatics project. So, to conclude, there are a number of private ordering strategies available to researchers to help promote sustainable open source bioinformatics software whilst preventing enclosure. Once again, I would like to thank the Common Workflow Language team for the opportunity to talk at this conference. If you have any questions, 
please feel free to ask me. Thank you very much.